Welcome to Sensible Secondhand Classics. This is a 1972 Mustin Maxi 1750. Very lovingly owned by Mr. Partridge, whose MGZ TT190 was one of the first cars we ever had on no budget reviews. I'm very grateful to him for letting me have a go in this quintessential British classic today. Maxi was introduced in April 1969 at a press event in Porto in Portugal. One of the things that people said about them at the time was uh, that the gear change was a little bit weird. It was a cable gear change. All Maxis have a five-speed gearbox and um, they don't feel you know, the same as uh, kind of a rod change like this one. Archie Vicker, one of the road testers, said it, it probably needs a little bit of work. It's a good idea, but it needs a little bit of work. He was sort of quite kind about it. But British Leyland, newly formed at the time, thought that actually maybe it needs a, you know, more than a little bit of work. So they changed the entire system on what are called the Mark II Maxi. This is a Mark II from early 72. And it has a rod change in it. The change feels very similar to an Allegro. And of course, I have driven an Allegro from 1974. And actually, this car with its uh, suspension system, but similar but not identical. This is a hydroelastic system, and the Allegro has a hydro gas one, of course. They kind of, they do feel quite similar to drive. In fact, even the seating position is sort of similar. Of course, this is a five-speed rather than a four-speed box. The uh, Allegros with this engine, the 1500 and 1750s, did also have the same gearbox in. She feels like quite a talky engine as well. So there were three engine options available in a Maxi. Originally it was a 1.5 litre engine with about 75 horsepower. Later in late uh, 1970, when the cars were addicted to the Mark II version, which uh, has the, the rod change in like this, and the car was facelifted slightly. The 1750 version was launched and uh, that has around 85 horsepower. Later in 72, after this car was made, the HL version was launched of the 1750 and that has about between 91 and 95 horsepower. I don't know why I've seen different things about that. It does also have servo assisted brakes and an all super match box. So it's a little bit easier to drive than some of the other cars I've had at this age. In 1977, they updated the suspension in, in the Maxi from this hydroelastic system, which um, was common to things like the ADO 16s, which are the 1100 1300s, and also the Mark II version of the, uh, the Mini. Uh, they updated that hydrogas, which is in the Allegro, and also in the, the Metro until, well, yeah, until it became the Rover 100 and died in 97. So there is actually a company out there, um, and multiple companies. I'm sure one I know is run by a gentleman by the name of Ian Kennedy, who has actually worked on this very car. Uh, I think it's called Hydrogas and Hydroelastic Services or something like that. I do. I've got that wrong. Engine makes a nice noise. It's very soft. This isn't by any means a sort of sports car, but the steering is. The steering, to be honest, is pretty good. The car seems to go where you want it, although it, it's not as direct as something like, I don't know, an MG Midget or something like that. Of course it isn't. This was very much designed, though, it's, uh, you know, the sort of person who wouldn't be interested in that kind of thing. Oh, viewers, look at this lime flower over lime flower. We are in, in the car park at the Coach and Horses in Cadenham because this is the uh, Lloyd Vehicle Consulting social event, um, although it's, it's quite early actually. 
this interior and exterior combination in this colour, this lime flower, is very rare on Maxis. I think this is only one of two cars remaining in this particular colour scheme. It is a 1750, the HR hadn't quite come out by this stage, so it was early 72 on a K. The uh, HL came out a little bit later, so it has a standard re heated rear window, along with a, a man who we have to pump up uh, for him to stand up. That sounds a bit weird, but just because it is. And, uh, you know, we'll have a look at him later, maybe, and how you make him stand up. That sounds really strange, just because it is. So, no reversing lights. They weren't required, I don't think, until about 1980 in this country. So we haven't got any. We've got one of those... Um, things to stop getting electric shocks and the exhaust has been moved to the middle so it doesn't really give you any extra power it just uh, um, actually makes it sound different no electric aerial just a normal aerial and of course uh, the prerequisite welsh based youtube channel sticker these little things to stop you uh, damaging someone else in a car park door handles and doors off a uh, land crab and look at how much access there is to get in. This car is smaller than a Peugeot 207. Now, you know we don't really like these on, on the channel viewers, but uh, we do like a nice maxi. And that's Mr. Partridge's driving position. He's a bit taller than me. And look at that. It's really good for a car of, of this particular era. I mean, the headroom's not the most. Um, I've got a little bit. But you sink down into this enormous vinyl bench seat. We've got period um, upgrade speakers on here because that is actually a cassette player. I don't think it's from 1972. I think it's from a little bit later. Uh, he's put the sheepskin seat covers on for me. And we've got the uh, interesting seat belts that um, I'm going to have to deal with later. Again, uh, which we don't particularly like. But we have got rear inertia reel seat belts, which is a very good idea. Ashtrays, of course. Ashtray, ashtray, ashtray at the front next to the window. Um, I think we've got maybe more than that, but there we go. And a five speed gearbox, which is common to all Maxis, of course, because they all use the same engine too the uh, 1.5 or 1.75 E series. You could obviously fold the seats down, you can actually fold them. Um, to make a bed if you wanted to. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, if you watch a twin cam video, then he, he shows you the seat configuration. I just I haven't quite got time to do that today, I'm afraid. But yeah, it's pretty comfortable. I can see why loads of people have very, very fond memories of traveling in these cars as children. Interior door handles used, I think, until the 1990s or later, possibly on the, uh, the Leyland DAF and LDV vans. So again, more land crab door action. This steering wheel is off an Austin 1300 GT, by the way. We've also got a row of uh, accessory things down here. Although the reheated window was standard. Let's change hands a second. Has a warning switch, that wasn't actually standard at this time. That came on some later Maxis. That one's a reheated window, and this one here the sort of blank, unmarked one, that's an intermittent wiper. So I think this has some accessories on it would have been ordered at the time. Indicator stalk on the right hand side, that does actually light up when you, uh, when you indicate. Fan speed is just, just there, Excuse me. fan speed just there. That's actually the wiper switch, choke cable. This is an aftermarket radio that goes to the speakers, and that is the uh, hot or cold for the heater. That is the position of the heater. And uh, I think we can look in the glove box, although I don't think these secret mission documents are going in. And we've even got a Hanimax camera as well, which I think is contemporary with the um, uh, stereo and the speakers. See if my secret mission documents go down on this shelf, because Alicus Agonis, who designed this car, is very fond of putting uh, shelves along the bottom of the dash. There's that uh, separate ashtray again. More interior door handles from marinas and other things. I think Legros as well. It's quite comfortable, actually. It's uh, 
very springy seat. I feel quite low down in this. Maybe it's because this windscreen's quite small. And of course, we've got, I think it's called a sunstrip at the, at the top of there. Um, little bullet style mirrors. Now these weren't in any way a, a given in 1972 to have any form of mirror. Um, some more manual air conditioning there. And the windy windows. This car has been fitted with period uh, row styles with the plug hole of despair. It's not cosmetically perfect this. I will put in a bit later on a, uh, a video which actually shows the common problem areas of uh, the Maxi which was filmed at the Practical Classics restoration show about a week ago. And uh, so that will show you, you know, things to look out for when you're buying a Maxi. But yes. Let's have a look actually at the hatchback because uh, you know it's all the fives, five, five doors, five speed, five seats, and then we'll take a look under the bonnet. So apparently, twist this oh, stiff. Right, one of the things I think that can happen on these is the boot struts wear out. I mean, it's, a, it's an old car now, but these are really stiff, and you actually have to push them down. The spare wheel should be in a cradle underneath the boot floor, but because of this centre exhaust, that's not there anymore. Now, it's quite a big boot for the time, and of course the rear seats do fold down. And amazingly, you've got the original parcel shelf in here as well, which is, which is great. Uh, yeah, there's the little chap who... Hmm, yeah. There's this little uh, pump thing by, by the, side of the, uh, the side of the seat. We might have to... Uh, activate him a bit later but he's not looking that happy at the moment so we'll just leave him to have his rest high level brake light in here which is uh, I think would have been probably 80s but I believe it works wow that's stiff <laughs> gosh okay it's my workout for my left arm um, let's have a look under the bonnet at the famous e-series engine so here we go. Um, interesting little cantilever arrangement for the bonnet stay. So this is a, a transverse E-series engine, developing in this instance around 85 horsepower. It's around that twin carb versions of this between 90 and 95, I think, and the smaller 1500. Uh, this is a 1.75, but 1500 is about. 74 horsepower, but a bit slow apparently. The 1500 maxis, but yeah, there we go. We've got they've got servo brakes in this, which is good. I like servo brakes. Radiator is on the side, and uh, as far as I remember, this is transmission in sump like a, a, a you know, a later metro or a mini or something, which is uh, see, interesting, and uh, yeah, the. Good old hydroelastic system. This has been pumped up recently, this hydroelastic. Now, very late, um, very late Maxis were just known as Maxis uh, rather than Austin. I think about 77 they dropped the Austin in. But this proudly wears its Austin and Maxi badges. HLs would have had a different uh, different badge from, from this. Right, apart from admiring these funny bits on the wipers, I think it's time to go out for another drive. Driving this car on the roads just on the outskirts of New Forest is an absolute joy. It's beautiful weather today. And yeah, just the, the gearbox, it's so strange how similar this feels to that four speed in the Allegro. And you know, like all of this sort of this Agonis stuff, if this is a car that's kind of plain but very, very sort of endearing. I can understand why people used to take these on long journeys because it's just so comfortable. Unfortunately, <laughs> my windscreen mount is jumping around because it always does that. Maxi wasn't really updated very much during its life. The sort of major thing that happened after the hydrogas system was introduced in 1977 was the fact that in 1979 the 1.5 engine was discontinued 
and then in 1980, mid-1980, the Maxi 2 version was launched, but really there's a Mark II and a Maxi 2 and they're not the same, so to be careful about, you know, designating what those are. But uh, yeah, so by, by I think about 77, they, they dropped the, the, the name from the, the Maxi of Austin, I mean, just called it the Maxi. Apparently after the rider report in British Leyland, that's something they should do to increase its appeal or something. But by 1980, this car's 1960s origins and the fact that it used these doors from 1964 were very evident in a, an increasingly kind of aging lineup that British Leyland had of their cars. And so they introduced the Maxi 2, which had you know, sort of a bit of a facelift. Um, for the 1981 model year, they got rid of the chrome bumpers and replaced them with matte black ones. And uh, they were just three trim levels, L, HL and HLS, and just one end, and just uh, the one engine, but with two power outputs. visual buyer's guide that um, the Maxi Owners Club actually produced if you're thinking of buying one of these cars. I'm just at the uh, 2022 Practical Classics Classic Car Restoration Show and uh, ahead of having a go in Mr Partridge's Maxi, I'm just going to film you this uh, buyer's guide, this visual buyer's guide that um, someone's very kindly done on this 7374 Maxi 1750. So, twin circuit brake servo, clutch slip primarily, gear or sort of failure, metallistic engine mounts, city bar bush, oil leaks come as standard. Twin carb exhaust manifold cracks, tops of winter wings rust, hydroelastic and hydroglass uh, displaces and pipes. I think hydroelastic and hydroglass were used on the Maxi. Steering rack, bush wear, front suspension, butterfly bushes, handbrake mount fatigue cracks, rusting suspension mount, metallistic suspension bushes, rear wheel arch rust, petrol tank rust, a lot of rust. Um, Back seat damage, particularly on the Series 2 cars. Parcel shelf sagging. Tailgate window seal. Series 2 trim I think this is a Series 2. Um, window seals with a curly end, so sorry. Sills and floor panels rust. And the door bottoms. It's trailing edge here. And then the wing brackets. Head out to surround rust, side light indicator. Thank you. So there we go, viewers. Those are all the things to look out for, as well as pitted, dented, and rusted bodywork. I hope that's helpful for you. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh visual buyer's guide. So do I feel like Basil Fawlty in the second series of Fawlty Towers? Well, sort of, but I can understand why he would have had one of these cars. It's reasonably easy to drive for a car of its era, and it makes very characterful noises. Suspension, of course, is just sort of what it is, and, uh, you know, that does need specialist uh, um, attention if there are any problems with it, whether it's a hydroelastic or hydrogas backsy. And, you know, these are quite rare cars now. They were neglected for a long time, the values were very low. But, uh, yeah, finding a good one would be in the region of sort of, I don't know, two to five thousand pounds, something like that, for a 
for a good one of these. A lot of them are MOT exempt. Actually, all, all of them are MOT exempt now because they've finished production in mid 1981. So uh, that's uh, that's obviously a, you know a benefit to people who want to use this on a daily basis. So thank you very much indeed once again for um, watching this episode of Sensible Secondhand Classics. Thank you to Mr. Partridge for letting me drive uh, another one of his cars. And uh, we'll see you again very soon for more old-fashioned but reasonably priced motoring. <laughs>